Well, a very good morning, everybody. Oh, we're definitely on. I can, I can hear my own mic this time, so... <laughs> is that too loud for everyone, or is that okay? Some nodded, some shook their heads. We've got no idea, really. <laughs> but no, it's great to see you all out here at the church on this, on this Sunday morning. Uh, these are warm days, aren't they? It's that point of the year where we can officially say the church is the coolest place to be. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry? In both ways, absolutely, exactly. Uh, but no, great to see you, those who are in the building here, uh, and those joining us online. You're very, very welcome to uh, join us as we spend this time together and as we carry on looking through our series in the book of Genesis, uh, which we'll continue on with, on with uh, a little later in the service. A few things just to let you know of. Um, first of all, just say after the, the morning service this morning, we are having an, an impromptu um, uh, session for anyone who's interested in membership with the church. So if there is anyone who would like to join us for that, you're very welcome after the service just to find out a bit more about what membership here at the church means. Also, just to say, um, this coming week, uh, I uh, I didn't put it in the newsletter, but I, I am on leave for a few days. Um, next week, Les is going to be uh, preaching for us and leading our service as we carry on through the book of Genesis. Um, so there isn't actually going to be a newsletter next week, but it leads me on to saying, if you don't get the newsletter here at the church and, and you've been coming along for a while, there is an email newsletter that goes out each week. Well, most weeks, just not this coming week. Yeah. Um, but if you want to sign up for that, you can do so. There are um, some little forms at the back which you can just give, a, give your details for. Um, and uh, you can receive that. Um, but I will be around on Thursday, just in case anyone who knows that I'm around for things on Thursday, I am around for things on Thursday as well. So there we are. Uh, just also to say, um, those who got the newsletter, um, you will have seen this week that in a couple of weeks' time, we're going to start holding some sessions on a Sunday afternoon. Uh, we're conscious that as we go through the book of Genesis, particularly the first couple of chapters, that it touches on some very sensitive and um, big issues in our culture today to do with identity and sexuality and marriage. Um, we said we'd look at those in a little bit more detail as a church, but not on a Sunday morning, uh, just together as a church. Um, and so these sessions are going to be only for our church family on a Sunday afternoon. The first one is on July the 2nd at 4.30 here uh, at the church, where we're going to be looking more generally at our cultural situation and how we respond with grace and truth before looking at a few of the particular issues themselves in the coming uh, first Sundays of the month in the months to come. So do put that in your diary, 2nd of July. We're going to give this a go <laughs> in talking about these, these difficult issues together. Um, and as I say, they're just open for our church family this time to come along to. We're going to talk about them together as a church, but you're very welcome to join us for those. And then finally to say uh, for this morning, today is also Father's Day, of course. And it's that day where fathers are appreciated and where, you know, whatever our experience of fatherhood here, here, here is on earth and has been here on earth, we get reminded from Scripture, don't we, that we have an incredible Heavenly Father, the perfect Heavenly Father who has given us so much, who is with us each and every day, who helps us, who cares for us, who watches over us, and whom we learn about in the Scriptures. And I'm just going to read these two Scriptures for us to get us started this morning. The first one from Lamentations 3, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And 1 John 3 verse 1, see what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. What a privilege we have the Heavenly Father that we do. Let's pray, give thanks, and commit our time to him. Lord God, we are so grateful for your great love towards us. That whatever our experience of fatherhood here on earth has been, we thank you that you are the perfect heavenly father. We do indeed thank you for fathers, and we thank you indeed for your faithfulness to us as Father. We thank you that you love us. We thank you that we can be called children of God. What an awesome privilege that is. 
And we thank you that we can know that, that we can be assured of that. And even as we look in the book of Genesis today at now what went wrong all those years ago in Genesis chapter 3, we are so grateful that you didn't abandon us either. That in your great mercy and grace, you sent Jesus to be our Savior, to know us, to love us, so that we might know you once again and be transformed by you. Thank you, Lord, that we know forgiveness and grace. And we pray, Lord, that as we spend this time together now, just a few moments on our Sunday morning, Lord, that you would bless our time. May your spirit be at work. May Jesus be lifted high amongst us as we sing, as we read from your word, as we pray together and give glory to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're going to remember that we have a mighty God who saves by standing and singing, Our God Saves, followed by Behold Our God. Shall we stand? In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit, Lord, we come, we are gathered together to lift up your name, to call on the Savior, to fall on your grace, hear the joyful sound of our offering as your saints bow down as your people sing we will rise with you lifted on your wings and the world will see that our God saves our God saves there is hope Go!
Thank you. Wonderful. If you'd like to take a seat, and uh, I'm going to invite John to come up and lead us in prayer this morning. Thank you. As, <clears throat> as Chris has reminded us, it's Father's Day today, where I'm glad we've got three kids. Um, when Jesus was asked by his disciples how they should pray, he taught them a very simple prayer. But it started off by saying, Our Father. And a few weeks ago when I prayed, I, we had the Lord's Prayer. And it obviously went down well because I said, Pray it in the version for which you are familiar. We prayed it out loud, and I reminded those of you whose birth tongue is not English, please use your own language as you pray out loud. 
And so together we gave praise to God in saying the Lord's Prayer. So we're going to start our prayers this morning again with the Lord's Prayer. So please speak up. Um, don't make me be the only one to say it. Last time I had to stop you and start again. Anyone would think I'd been a headmaster. Um, so please let's say it together in whatever tongue you like. We'll say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive the sins, those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We praise and thank you, our Heavenly Father, that you are not like we earthly fathers with all our faults and blemishes, but we can come to you filled with awe that the one who created the universe cares for each one of us, with such love and mercy. As we just prayed for forgiveness, we are so grateful, Lord, that the good news of Jesus offers us that amazing relationship with you. And once in that relationship, having accepted Jesus as Saviour and Lord, you allow us a fresh start each time. As we pray for others, we bring before you some of those in need in our broken world. We remember the poor and marginalised, including in our own country, the people Jesus stressed he came for. We're concerned, Lord, about the increasing wealth gap enhanced by inflation and thank you for all the agencies who help those struggling to cope. We pray for those who are unwell, physically or psychologically, and those awaiting tests or procedures. We thank you for the skill and application of those who treat them with care and compassion. We pray for the bereaved, those who comfort them, and those who work in palliative care. We remember people affected by the increase in domestic abuse at home and those who experience conflict at work. We pray for effective interventions to reduce tension and stress levels. And we pray for the millions in this world who are persecuted, punished, risk death or become religious migrants just because they are Christian. So many cannot worship you freely in church or even online as we can today. And so we thank you for our freedom. Father, we bring before you some of the specific problems reported in the last few days. Uganda, where over 40 students were murdered in school and others abducted by rebels claiming to be the Islamic group IS. Nottingham, where three people were murdered by an offender who also attempted to murder three others with a stolen vehicle. For the United Nations investigation into the drowning of hundreds, particularly women and children migrants, off the coast of Greece. That closed country of North Korea, where it was shown this week that so many are dying of starvation while money is spent on munitions. The sabotage dam in Ukraine and the efforts, both physical and spiritual, for those affected, remembering the work of our brother Victor. Father, these are just a few specific problems which have been brought to our attention. We ask that the world may be more compassionate get its priorities right, and justice to be done by those in positions of authority. We thank you 
for those who respond in your name. Lord, if our response through our words and actions should be the answer to some of our prayers this morning, may we be open to your Spirit's leading. And so we come before you in prayer, in the name of Jesus, and all God's people said, Amen. Thanks, John. We, we live in a broken world, don't we? In all manner of ways. Um, and the reality of that hits home every time we put on the news, doesn't it? We see all sorts going on. And we know from ourselves that we are also a broken people. And this morning we are going to be looking at where that all came from, how it all came about, all those, well, I was going to say decades, it's a bit longer than that, centuries, thousands of years ago when Adam and Eve uh, were on this earth and they fell. It's funny, isn't it, that when we go, as we go back to revisit the Garden of Eden again, what happened just in, in one located place, it seems so far away from the world in which we live now, and yet at the same time it makes complete sense that handed down through the generations and generations, we have the problems of humanity that came out of that first act. So we're going to read together uh, before we uh, sing again and then hear from God's Word. We're going to read from Genesis chapter 3. If you want to find it in the Green Bibles, it's page 5. Uh, but Agnes is going to come and read verses 1 to 24 of the chapter for us. Thank you. Now the snake was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the snake, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the snake said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree from which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, The snake deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord God said to the snake, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly, and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and will strike his heel. To the woman, he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. To Adam, he said, Because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree, which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed its ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat from it all the days of your life. 
It will produce thorns and thistles for you. You will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground since from it you were taken. For dust you are and dust you will return. <clears throat> Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all the living. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. And the Lord God said, The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the garden of Eden to work in the ground from which he had been taken. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. This is the word of the Lord. And this is the circumstance by which we fell. We're going to look at this in a little bit more detail uh, in a few moments' time, but before we do, we remind ourselves that we can do nothing else but by Jesus Christ himself, yet not I, but through Christ in me, followed by amazing grace. Let's stand and sing. What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing. All is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. The night is dark, but I am not forsaken. The Savior, He will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing. For in my need, His power is displayed. To this I hold, my shepherd will be.
we're so grateful for that reminder from amazing grace that you have given us amazing grace how sweet the sound it is to be reminded that we have the grace of God through Jesus Christ we're thankful too that it reminds us that you have promised us good and particularly Lord as we look now at what went wrong all those years ago may we see your goodness also at work for us your good provision and your good grace in jesus name we pray these things amen amen well please do uh, take a seat well if there is a problem you've got to be able to diagnose it haven't you and this is essentially what we're going to be doing this morning as we look at genesis 3 and it's amazing isn't it Things went so wrong so quickly after humanity was made. We get a full two chapters in the Bible. Two chapters where everything is good, everything's going well, and then everything takes a sharp nosedive and goes completely wrong. Uh, We looked at creation itself in chapter 1. We looked at God's foundation for our lives in Genesis 2, and now it's the fall in Genesis 3. And basically, what we're going to look at this morning is um, what happened when we fell, and how did it all come about? There's the old joke, of course, which goes that Adam blamed Eve, Eve then blamed the snake, and the snake didn't have a leg to stand on. That's as good as it's going to get, I'm afraid. Um, But what happened when, when when we look at this question of what happened to us when we fell? 
And you know, there's an awful lot that we learn as we diagnose the condition that we have as humanity. In fact, if you look through, if you think through the chapter itself, we learn about the nature of temptation and sin and what sin in fact is. Uh, In the very first human sin, we learn so much about the nature of it and its character, the way it works in our lives and gets into our lives and what to be aware of because of it. We see, uh, you know, as the prayers that we had earlier reflected, that we see why the world is the way it is today. Genuinely, it can be traced back all those years to this very event of the first sin and the fall of humanity. We see the root of sin, how it came about and how it's pervaded humanity ever since. All sorts of problems, issues, conflicts, and not least between humanity and God himself. It also answers a couple of questions, in fact, about the devil as well. We don't often talk about the devil or or Satan, as he's also known, and his role in sin. Did the devil make me do it? It's a question people sometimes ask. Did the devil make me do it? Did he make Adam and Eve do what they did? Where does he fit in this equation of uh, the one who is described as the tempter, the deceiver, basically the anti-God figure of all human history? Is he just this mischievous, horned-looking fella who's all red, who seems to like pitchforks and smirking a lot? Is he just that, or is there more to him to it? Well, we're going to do our best this morning. Lots of things we could cover, so little time to answer them. And that's before we get to God himself and what he does and what he does for us in particular. He gloriously does some things for us in this chapter as well, even as it all goes wrong. So we're going to dive right into it this morning, uh, where our passage begins with the first few verses and look at the nature of temptation, first of all. Um, Really, verses 1 to 7, it's the first scene of the chapter. We rejoin, don't we, the Garden of Eden, this idyllic place uh, of all that God had made, and Adam and Eve, uh, his wife, um, she's not in fact got a name until later in the chapter, that comes a little bit later, following the wonders of all God, God puts in place and given them. Um, And indeed, all he's given them in chapters 1 and 2. Chapter 1, it finishes those six days of creation with God looking out at all that he had made and declaring it was all very good. Very good, he declares. And it's because at the end, he's made humanity, the pinnacle of his creation, the people who are unique and that he is going to be able to relate with. He declares it all very good. And then we finished chapter 2 with that beautiful account at the end of the chapter of the first giving in marriage in the Bible and the concluding words, Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. So end of chapter 1, it's very good. Everything's very good. End of the chapter 2, it's no shame. No shame in humanity at all. No shame at all. It's not felt, it's not known, it's not experienced. There is no shame at work. It sounds good, doesn't it? Sounds good to to us. You've got innocence, you've got unity, you've got glorious peace in its deepest form. They are the overriding hallmarks of humanity at the end of chapter 2. It's perfect, and God will have been just as pleased about it. And then chapter 3 opens. Oh yes, chapter 3 opens and a new character emerges, the snake. Or serpent, as he's known in older translations, but a slithering creature regardless who is going to be the first voice of disruption, of disharmony against the foundations that God has just laid in place, and ultimately the tempter of disobedience leading to the very first sin. So let's think a little bit about him first of all. Um, Is this just a figurative character or creature, a sort of story, a mythological story to explain what happened, or are we talking about a real snake with real people? Well, first of all, Adam and Eve, real people definitely. They they are literally there in the garden in the manner described. Jesus and Paul in the New Testament, they both refer back to this couple and Paul uh, directly to Adam's fall. In fact, if you look at the genealogy of Jesus in Luke's gospel, he goes all the way back to Adam. It takes you through all of the generations back to Adam. Well, not not all of the generations, it's a summary, but the, 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 the summary of generations back to Adam himself. So we're talking about a real couple here, a real couple who really fell. The snake, is he just figurative for some kind of evil or an actual creature? Well, again, he's a real creature. 
we read in the end of verse 1, now the snake was more crafty than any of the wild animals. The Lord God had made. So God has made this creature. It's part of his creation. And ultimately, of course, we're reminded God created Satan in the first place. It's worth saying. Satan is not a god. He's pretending to be that or trying to be that. He doesn't occupy that position or power, albeit he wanted to, and that was the problem. He's a created angel, formerly called Lucifer, which means light bearer, um, who was created to be in the service of God, who we read elsewhere in the Bible has himself fallen because he rebelled against God. He provoked possibly a third of the angels to join with him uh, in the rebellion who became demons, and he got cast out of heaven onto earth itself to rule there instead. Satan's dominion is not hell. Don't believe the cartoons. His dominion is the earth. Okay, This is where his kingdom is, and this is where he is now at work. I think the next slide, there's an image, um, an illustration of the, the fall of Satan. Um, this is by Gustav Dorr from uh, John Milton's Paradise Lost, that famous poem uh, a couple of centuries ago. This depiction of Satan being cast out along with his fellow angels uh, by Michael, the archangel. Satan's dominion is now on earth where he falls from that position, where he sets out to deceive the world. And we don't know quite when that happened. It was sometime before this event in Genesis 3, it seems, but Jesus himself says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven in Luke chapter 10. Paul himself says, Satan himself masquerades now. Interesting, he was called light bearer, okay? He now masquerades as an angel of light. Perhaps explaining the tone of this passage, where what Satan says looks so good to Adam and Eve, it seems compelling for reasons we'll come to, and certainly with a bit of twisting, he seems to be able to make a pretty good argument on the surface of things. But at the end of the day, it's a masquerade. It's all cloak and dagger. It's darkness posing as light and enlightened thinking. Thoughts planted that become temptations and temptations that lead to rebellion. And we know specifically the snake is the devil because in the book of Revelation, chapter 12, it describes that previously mentioned ancient battle between God and Satan, and it says this, the great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who does what? Leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. So these are one and the same. These are one and the same. The snake is the devil. And, and, and whether or not, uh, this, the text isn't clear, whether or not Satan has possessed the snake, certainly he changes from being a dragon to a snake uh, within that, that, that verse just then. Whether he changed form to be a snake or, or whether he just simply convinces Adam and Eve that the snake is talking, because let's face it, no ordinary snakes talk, at least not the ones that I've seen. I don't think it matters. What matters is it's Satan at work. The snake is what's described. And everything, the whole created order itself, gets turned upside down and on its head because of his own scheming. Did God really say, Eve, you must not eat from any tree in the garden? It's clever, because he is clever. And it's oh so subtle as well. Because let's face it, to get back to the action, where's the harm as he introduces himself to Eve? Where's the harm at its outset in having a discussion about what God has said and done? Doesn't appear to be any harm in it to begin with. You know, do I overhear Eve? I don't know why, but I imagine he's got a posh voice. Do I overhear Eve? That God said something about not eating from any tree in the garden? Please, will you clarify it for me? Tell me, what did God actually say? I think I might have missed it. Clever. Clever. 
In fact, what Satan did was he was tapping into something, two things in fact, about human nature itself that even at the outset seemed to be apparent. The first is this. He taps into the fact that we all like to feel important. First thing he does. Have you ever been in a situation where someone, or you're in a group, and someone asks a question of somebody else in the group, and because you know the answer to it, you jump in and give the answer before they get a chance to answer? You ever done that before? I have. Why do we do it? It's because we like to feel that we know what the case is. And it gives us that little feeling of importance that we know something that other people don't. Remember, Satan knows us. And in fact, he also knows us better than we know ourselves because he's known humanity for so long. You know, even at the start, he seems to have the inside track on our proclivities, the natural inclinations of our heart. And he does it by getting Eve to clarify, it's so clever, a prohibition that he implies God may have put in place. You see, the one thing the devil has got to overcome in all of this, the one powerful object that he's got to get Eve and Adam over in order to cause them to fall is this. He's got to overcome what God has directly said. That's the hurdle he's got to get over with Adam and Eve what God has actually said and why he has said it. That's the crux of the whole thing. So he starts by tapping into this this sense of self-importance and self-determination. And then second, very cleverly as well, he makes out, in perhaps a small way to begin with, that God, well, God may just be being a little bit miserly towards them. He's being a little bit of a meanie towards them. What did God say you couldn't do again? See how clever that is? You hear people when they make arguments like that. So what did he say you couldn't do, first of all? I mean, we all know that if there's a sign saying, don't step on the grass, what do you immediately want to do? You immediately want to step on the grass, right? (laughs) These sorts of things are inbuilt in us. It doesn't take much to bring them out. What did God say you couldn't do again? Was it eat from any tree in the garden? I can't remember. I'm only a lowly snake after all, and you're much more enlightened about these things. Tell me, Eve, what did he say? It's very clever. And it's one of the oldest tricks in the book, one that he's going to develop in just a moment. Because make no mistake about it, Here's the other thing that God knows be- uh, that, that Satan knows better than we do. Satan knows God better than we do. He's been with him or was with him for a lot longer as well. That shouldn't make him scary because he's not God, but it should make us very wary of him and what he's able to do, of things that masquerade as light but are actually darkness. He's good at his job. Now, now he knows full well that there is a reason why God has told them not to eat from one tree in the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I mean, for starters, it's the only tree. It is the only tree that is off limits to them. That is how quotes on quotes miserly God is actually being, although he's not even being that for reasons we'll, we'll come to in a moment. In all of the goodness of God towards humanity, it's the only tree that's off limits. So he's got to get them thinking that God's being prohibitive somehow, that God is being a bit mean, and that through this tree, this one off limits tree, God is withholding something from them that they really do want and need, that would really benefit them, that he doesn't want them to have because he's being restrictive of them. And what does Eve do? She walks right into the trap that is placed before her. Because we discover, perhaps again like all of us, that we kind of want what God wants too. We want to be a bit like him as well. I mean, you can see it in her reply, first of all. Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Eve replies, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. Notice the tree isn't named. She doesn't actually name specifically the tree, just where it is. Already, 
for whatever reason it might be, she's begun to gloss over this somehow. She's begun to smudge the lines away at the edges. She doesn't say which tree it is, only where, and she's clearly already changing what God has said in some way. Because, if you notice, she adds to what God has said. Now, God said they weren't to eat from the tree. She adds, and you must not touch it either. God's not said that. He's not said they can't touch it. It's just about the eating part. I mean, I would suggest, here's here's a note on temptation itself, that if you're already beginning to play with something around the edges, and perhaps even playing with something that God has said, it won't be long until you fall into the trap of it. It doesn't take long if you're playing around the edges of an issue, of something that is in fact sinful, to fall into its trap if you begin playing with it. It's a word of warning. Temptation is often a slippery slope which begins with something borderline or sometimes with something that's very good in fact, but gradually, slipperily, in a slippery way, leads to something that it's wrong. And it's like that with the word of God too, in fact. If you begin playing with it, and playing around with it, you might just fall into Satan's deceptive trap. It's the old saying, start playing with fire and you'll soon somehow get burned. And finally, if you can also be convinced alongside this that God's being mean and miserly and, you can, and she's begun adding to his commands by playing with them, if you, can, if you can also be convinced that the consequence will not be as bad as God has made it out to be, and in fact, It might just be beneficial to you, better for your self-governing life, better for your desire for self-importance and personal growth. I mean, these are compelling arguments, aren't they? They are hugely compelling arguments. It's the kind of prod that an angel of darkness masquerading as an angel of light will try and give you which is when Satan finally gets her to that place of disobedience. He knows a big lie has got to be swallowed, a big one. It's a corker, okay? It's a big lie that's got to be swallowed in order for this to work. But if he can just put enough doubt into the mix to question what God has said, to make him out like he is being a bit restrictive, and he can lace it somehow with a desire to create of our own and to have things on our own terms, he can then swing the big sucker punch lie at us, which we may just swallow. And here it comes. You will not certainly die, he says. For God knows, here's how God's being mean, that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened And you will be like God, knowing good and evil. What's the big lie? The lie's the consequence, isn't it? You won't die. Brazenly. It's the most brazen attack on God's sovereignty and authority in all of history. Eve... Don't believe what God says. It won't be as bad as you think. That's what Satan does. It's the clinching argument. And I mean, look at the mess we've been in ever since. The mess of our world around us. And tell me that's not the biggest lie in history right there. It should make her do what we all should do when we're tempted by things, by the way. It should make her run for the hills to get away from it. But he's already got her drawn in. She's already in that place. He's already given compelling reasons to carry on the conversation. And he's just about to give another. Because who doesn't want to be like God in some way, shape, or form? Who doesn't want to occupy the position of God in our own universes when it comes down to it? Knowledge is power, after all, so the saying goes. And the whole point, here's the bit about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the whole point of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is that if we eat it, we would in some sense, we would become like God in eating its fruit. We'd lose the innocence of basking in everything that good that God had given 
that simple trust, the relationship we had before, as, we eat the, as they would eat, were to eat the fruit, it would open them up to be able to determine good and evil, to be able to see it for what it really is, and then the ability to walk in it as well. Just by eating the fruit, which opened them up to it. And when you put it in those terms, you realize why God doesn't want them to do it. Why he withholds that particular element, because it isn't good for us. I mean, only God at the end of the day should know what is right and good for his creation. But he wants us to choose that as well, to find him so compelling that we wouldn't even go near the thing which would tell us otherwise. That we would find him so compelling that we would live his ways and listen to his word. I mean, he gave them every good tree, bar for food, bar one, that's all. That was his gift. I mean, God is in no way being miserly to them by withholding one tree by him being the one to determine what is right and wrong. But if you begin to doubt that God is gracious and good, begin to think he's not got our best interests at heart, begin to think he is withholding from us all that we could be, when in fact he made us, suddenly we can end up in that place, in the thinking that leads us far from him, just as Eve does. And let's apply it to today's world as well. Let's let's take it to to today's, today's world. Our world does this, all the time. You'll hear things all the time like, well, the God of the Bible, he's harsh, he's vindictive, isn't he just restrictive? He holds us back from being everything we can be. Throw off the shackles then, Abandon his rules. Do what you feel is right. Be who you truly are. Determine for yourself whom you can be and forget the maker of heaven and earth and what his word has said. Or if not forget it, at least change it. Alter it a bit to make it just that little bit more palatable to our modern thinking. These are literally the oldest tricks in the book because they're the ones Satan used to get Adam and Eve to fall when of course what God really wants for us this picture we get of him what God really wants for us is to walk with us in the paradise of Eden with him with a simple trust that his word is true and good that he is the God of the universe and he really does know what's best for us. He calls us not to be deceived into thinking we can make our own way. Be it, as Eve points out when she looks at the fruit, by the appearance of the fruit. Well, it seems good for food. Why not? Seems okay. Might benefit me. Yeah, but by whose determination? You know, it's so easy to rationalize sin. Really easy to do it if we want to do it. By it being pleasing to the eye. Looks fun. You know, it'll be pleasurable. It's good to eat. It's good for food. It's, it, it's good. Others are doing it. It doesn't seem to hurt them. Perhaps God is just being overly restrictive, and we do know better. By it being desirable for gaining wisdom, she notices. Well, surely wisdom's good, isn't it? Surely being able to see and determine right and wrong in some manner helps us to create of our own, to give us independence. I mean, surely that's good. These are the kind of values that our world really values these days. Independence, apart from anyone else, who doesn't love it in today's world? It's it's used and portrayed as like the highest value we can ever have. And you know what? It's so easy to believe things which ultimately separate us from God and might just be the very same things that lead to death itself. Separating ourselves from the goodness, provision, and presence of God. How, when all is said and done, how can that be better? How can it be better for us, is the question we get to. Yet these are the rules by which our world works now. You know, that we've progressed beyond the ancient fables about God and notions that he has told us what's best. Before the pandemic in the, in, in the UK, 
5% of the population attended church regularly. That was pre-pandemic. I mean, the proof is in the pudding. The, the, world, the Western world in particular, I would say, has and is rejecting God. We'd rather have things our own way, even if knowingly, or indeed unknowingly, it will lead to death. Eve's taken in. She believed it. And let's not forget Adam, who goes along with it too. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. I mean, suddenly you notice, don't you, that what was so sweet and so good, that picture of no shame at the end of Genesis 2, has already broken apart. It's already become shameful to them. Innocence has been lost. The, The paradise of living in this goodness of God to determining what's good themselves, it shatters the picture of Eden irreparably in a moment. And it breaks their relationship of trust with God himself. I mean, even down to that, I mean, it's a tragic picture, really, when you think about it. The, 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 the cluelessness of, of trying to cover themselves up using some flimsy lit fig leaves that they've found to, to hide what has tragically become shameful. I mean, it's a terrible picture of where this leads. Right from the moment of fall, they try and patch it all up by putting what amounts to a sticking plaster, some fig leaves, over the open wound of shame that's broken out. That's broken out between each other, that's broken out across creation from this point, and that has broken out before their maker as well. This is a travesty. Let's not think of it anything less than that. And this is where our world went wrong. It's where all the pain, all the suffering has come from. All the strife and conflict has entered. And it's where death itself entered the human condition and we've lived with its consequences ever since. Did the devil make us do it? No. He can never make us do anything. But what he can do is he can prod and provoke and masquerade, get us to doubt God, And he may just do enough that we too can be taken in. These are the oldest tricks, and he employs them in the newest ways with us today. When God calls us, not to a false light, not to an angel masquerading as light, but to the true light, which brings life to all of humanity. What about the last couple of points? Uh, the, the, these are shorter, but what, what happens next? Well, first of all, there, there is a necessity for judgment, which is obvious after this. Uh, God appears in the cool of the day. You know, if, if we thought what comes next, by the way, sounds awful, it is in one sense, and maybe God, um, and, and God is working in a certain way to deal with what is happening. But, you know, the very fact that he shows up after this rejection of him tells a story. From the start of all things, God really wanted us. And even in the fall, he still does. He's still there in the garden looking for the people whom he loves and has made, even though he knows that they've rejected him already. Do you know, if I, I think one of the solutions to our world today, to the, to the confused world, state of the world that we've got, to to some of these thoughts that people have about God and so on. Do you know, I think if our world truly understood the passion by which God wants us, that he really does deeply care about you and me, far more than even we as believers understand at times, we would find deep wells of persuasion to convince our world that unlike the lies the devil foisted on Eve, God really is desiring us. He really is desiring that we relate with him, that he really does love us with an unquenchable love, a love that is even seen as he judges Adam and Eve. 
I mean, the world would find new hope. If we as Christians cannot be convinced that God truly does have our best interests at heart, and even where he puts rules in place, even where he disciplines us in life, that it is still in his goodness that he does so, what chance does our world have? It will go on believing his judgments are vindictive, that his restrictions hold us back, that we should be free to live exactly what we feel we should and being exactly who we think we should be. If God is no longer good, then why trust him at all? And yet even after the fall, where do we find him? We find him back in the garden, longingly seeking, searching for his people, even giving them the chance to explain themselves. He doesn't rush into judgment and make sure that we know why. You know, it's like parents doing a bit of detective work with a child, you know, asking the right questions of a child about what's good and what's not and what's happened, and then having to discipline them, getting them to, but getting them to see that what they did was wrong, except this time the discipline will affect the rest of history. They do the Adam blamed Eve, Eve blamed the snake, the snake didn't have a leg to stand on. They do all of that. They do all of that. They blame each other. And then God begins dealing with them, starting with the snake. Here's what he does. Number one, the snake is cursed. Satan is cursed. He deals with him. And the emblem of his cursing is the indignity of crawling on his belly, eating dust for the rest of his life. Uh, <laughs> Some people wonder, is this the, did the snake have legs before? Did he lose them at this point? I don't think that's particularly the issue. No idea. But the picture is more about Satan than snakes at this point. He's judged and cursed and will one day be defeated. What about the woman? Well, the woman gains pain in the very expression of God's call to multiply and fill the earth in childbirth. Excruciating as a sign of what the fall has done. And in relationship with her husband, that relationship lying at the heart of the human race for, amongst other things, its multiplication, that their, their relationship will be tainted by the desire for mastery. On both sides, in fact, not mutual submission out of love. Even the most intimate of relationships will become fractured. What about Adam? Whereas Eve has to now endure the sharp pains in connection with childbirth, Adam receives the long, drawn-out pain of lifelong toil from the ground, the earth frustrating all attempts to grow food, the necessity for life, producing thorns and thistles, getting in the way of God's blessing towards them. Even creation is tainted at this point as a sign of what the fall has done to the earth, and finally compounded by the entering of death into the world. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. A reversal to the origins as judgment. But is that all this tells us as we come to a conclusion? Do you know it's not? It's not all it tells us. Even in what seems like a damning judgment, we see kindness and grace in our final heading, the signs of salvation. You see, the last part of the passage, it seems negative in verse 20 to 24, but it's not. Adam and Eve are banished from the garden, but it's because God sees need to separate them from the tree of life that enables them to live forever. For starters, who would want to live forever in such a tragic fallen world? We can't even imagine what that would be like. The frustration of it, the shame associated with it, the endless cycles of sin we seem to get caught in. God knows that that's not the correct end goal. It's certainly not what he wants for his people. So he expels them from the tree of life in the garden and bars the way back in. Again, not being vindictive, they just won't live forever now. Death will be an end to their natural life on earth. And in one sense, it's actually a kindness that it doesn't perpetuate the kind of hopeless life that they may have otherwise been living. Not that life should be thrown away, don't get me wrong. There is innate purpose, and as we'll see, true hope that comes about, but the way is barred to living forever to prevent us experiencing the ongoing cycles of tragedy in life. But then you also take in what God is doing in, in, in things for them too, alongside. It's here that 
Eve gets her name. Adam names her Eve. He's able to see through what God is doing and saying that there is a future. She will be the mother of all the living, as the name means. It's glimmers of faith rebirthing again. It's proof that purpose still very much exists. And then do you notice what God does for them directly? He reclothes them. He gives them new clothes. He takes away their sticking plaster fig leaves that they've tried to make and God makes proper new clothes and gives it to them as a gift or in other words he sacrifices an animal to cover their shame I wonder what that points towards Do you know, a few weeks ago, we covered something about being reclothed by Christ through the resurrection. And isn't sacrifice the pattern of both Old Testament worship and then finally in Jesus Christ himself, the one who fully and finally sacrifices himself to cover our sin and shame forever? And just to get back, finally, finally, where we started, what's the bit we skipped when God was talking to the snake? Didn't he say something to the snake about putting enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers? And didn't he curiously, tantalizingly say to the snake regarding Eve's offspring, he, not they, he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. So what's God going to do? He's going to clothe his people afresh using sacrifice to do it, And we see it here. He'll cover his people's shame through the gifts of garments that are not made by themselves. And one day there will be an offspring of Eve's named He, who will crush the serpent's head, even as the serpents strike at his heel. Now, striking of a heel means temporary pain. But the crushing of a head is a final judgment and a final victory that will one day come about. I wonder who God had in mind. That's the joy at the end of the passage because we learn God is good. He doesn't give us what we deserve, though he deals with sin. And he gives us hope is one day coming Savior and Lord. Let's pray and give thanks for all he's given us. Lord, your word is astounding as it helps us see and diagnose our own condition and our own proclivities. Uh, The desires that we have to create of ourselves, to do our own thing, to live on our own terms, Lord God, when you have in fact given us so much. And we know, Father God, that even we as believers in you struggle with that at times. We struggle to remain faithful to you. We struggle because we do get things wrong. We struggle because sin still tries to have its way and Satan still tries to have his way with us. And yet, Lord, we are also so thankful of the picture that Genesis 3 gives to us, that whilst it diagnoses our condition and the condition of our world for us and portrays it so clearly for us to see, it also gives us a picture of the glory and goodness and grace of God towards us as sinners. That yes, indeed, you have given us a future and a hope. That yes, indeed, you have given us new clothes to cover our shame. That yes, indeed, one day there will be the final end of a victory that you started in Jesus Christ when he gave himself for us on the cross. That one day Satan will be fully and finally defeated. That one day we can enjoy the hope of a perfection with you for all of eternity. 
not just managing our way, not just stumbling through, but perfection and freedom and hope and joy and peace to worship you, to be with you forever. So Lord, I pray for us this morning. We pray and ask that you would fill us with that same hope and enthusiasm to be a people who follow you in this place. May we be able to see through the devil's schemes and resist them, Lord God, because we want to serve you. May we be a people of the gospel which truly brings hope to all through what Jesus has done. And may we ourselves come to that knowledge, that that motivation and fulfillment that comes through knowing that you love us so dearly and so deeply and you care about each of us in such a deep way that we don't often always acknowledge Lord God. And yet it is true as you look down from on high and walk with us in our lives. So grant us your grace as we go into the coming week and may we be filled with enthusiasm to follow you more closely. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Well, as we finish our service, we're going to sing as we close and those on live stream will leave us after this song. We're going to remember that great sacrifice by which God saves all things. Once again, I look upon the cross where he died. Let's stand together and sing. Jesus Christ, I think upon your sacrifice. You became nothing, poured out to death. Many times I wondered at your gift of life I'm in that place once again I'm in that place once again And once again I look upon the cross where you died I'm humbled by your mercy and I'm broken inside Once again, I pour out my life. Now you are exalted to the highest place, King of the heavens, where one day I'll bow. But for now, I marvel at your saving grace. I'm full of praise once again. praise once again and once again I look upon the cross where you died I'm humbled by your mercy and I'm broken inside once again I thank you once again I pour out my life and once again again.